Today, we are going to talk about RNA-seq. This is a very important module in the course. And we start by showing the transcription and splicing. We know that in the genome, a portion of the sequence code for genes. And so this is on the DNA and from central dogma of biology, we know that this can be transcribed into a primary transcript or pre-mRNA, which includes the exons, which are important functional modules, and these spacers or introns, which just connects the functional modules together. A process called splicing happens, which removes those spacers in between, so all the functional modules are stitched together. This will create a mature mRNA, and the transcript will then exit the nucleus to the cytoplasm where translation happens, and the mRNA will be a template to translate into the protein, which will have the real function for the gene. Ideally, we want to get a protein abundance in the cell because the overall protein abundance in the cell really dictates the status of a particular cell or tissue or organ. Unfortunately, the technology for measuring protein abundance, especially at genome scale, is quite limited. Therefore, RNA is a proxy for the overall cell state, um, which measures all the expression level of different genes um, in the genome. And so RNA-seq is a technique that was invented around 2007 or 2008. The procedure worked roughly like this. Over the years, there has been different variations of the technique, but the basic idea is all similar. Basically, you collect all the RNA from the cell, and we can remove the, the, the contaminating DNA. So this is a collection of all the RNAs in the cell. And there could be a process which remove the superabundant rRNA or tRNA from the total RNA, which will um, which can also select the mRNA, which has the more uh, cell type specific features in the cell. And at this level, the RNA can be pretty long, sometimes a few KB long. But currently, with high throughput sequencing, we can't sequence as long. Therefore, the RNA needs to be fragmented into shorter fragments. And then um, using different primers, we can use reverse transcription to generate a cDNA of those little RNA fragments. So each fragment could be maybe a few hundred base pair long. And um, reverse transcriptase basically will generate now double-stranded DNA. And so we continue the procedure here. Um, sometimes in the experimental procedure, the users of RNA-seq might want to sequence out the specific strand from the original RNA. Um, so there might be additional steps needed in here. Um, but in most of the cases, people don't really care which strand, they just sequence out the full mRNA, uh, sorry, the, the fragmented cDNA. And so at this time, you adapt the sequencing adapter to the end of the cDNA, um, and then PCR amplify everything in between, select a fragment that are more of similar lengths. And these are usually a couple hundred or you know, two, three hundred base pair fragments. And then put that on the high throughput sequencing machine. Um, and then we will sequence out the cDNA ends, uh, which can be from either end of the sequencing adapter. So for example, if we do pair end sequencing, we will sequence from this sequencing adapter and then the beginning um, basis on the, this strand, we can also use the other sequencing uh, adapter and sequence the reverse strand um, on, on, on here. And what you will get is uh, pairs of reads for this particular fragment.
So that's the basic RNA-seq protocol. So RNA-seq uh, has many, many applications. It's very, very versatile. The very basic application is we want to examine the expression of all the genes in a specific condition. This could be a developmental stage or comparing different tissues or organs, comparing normal physiological status versus disease stage. Also, the cells can be, or the tissues or organs, or the animals could be under drug treatments or gene perturbation. You knock out a gene or you overexpress a gene and so on. So you just want to look at the, the differential genes in, in different conditions. RNA-C can also be used to identify novel genes or transcript. For example, in the genome, say human genome, people have annotated, say, uh, 20,000 genes, and in terms of transcript, probably 50,000 transcripts. But then doing RNA sequencing, you might find a region of the genome which previously was not annotated to have a gene, but clearly this is you know, RNA that you sequenced out. So there's something happening in that location which is making an RNA. And so this can be used to identify novel genes or novel transcript. It can be used to model alternative splicing so we mentioned in here that from the original gene, there are exons, which are the functional modules, which are stitched together by introns. These are spacers. In different cell conditions, it could be that the cell is, is um, expressing all the exons, or the mature transcript include all the exons in this gene. But the, depending on the different conditions, there are different splicing factors that control the selection of different axons to be st stitched together. So in some conditions, a cell might be making a, a mature mRNA that's, uh, or mRNA that's only a selection of the axons, say one, two, three, or one, three, four. And so some axons can be eliminated or skipped. And so this might have different functions for the same gene. Um, so using RNA sequencing, we can model the alternative splicing. You can see how different axons are stitched together to form the mRNA. We can also use it to identify gene mutations. For example, if we know the normal person's DNA is at certain is at this location is a C, but somehow after the RNA sequencing, we see some of this transcript making a C, but other transcript might be having a, a T or a G. This potentially could indicate mutations um, for, for on this gene. There are also cases of gene fusions. For example, in the genome, there might be a normal gene A and a normal gene B, but in some disease situation, especially in cancers, we might see two genes fused together. This could be a translocation on the DNA. So in this case, the beginning part of gene B is stitched to the second half of gene A. This create a fusion transcript. And in the RNA sequencing, we will see many reads that cover this junction. This indicates that gene A and gene B are fused together and this gene might have now a more oncogenic function. Um, the, the advantage of RNA-seq compared to early days when people were using either PCR or expression microarray is that we do not need to know the genome sequence or predict the genes. If you can isolate the RNA of a new species um, that nobody has sequenced before, you can start um, using RNA-seq at least to figure out in this genome, what are the potential functional elements, um, especially the genes in, the, in, in this new species. And so it's, it's like a Swiss army knife. You can use RNA sequencing to um, understand many different things. Um, so compared to previous microarray way of analyzing expression, RNA sequencing gives you a digital representation of gene expression. Every read you get is a real transcript from that original cell. And it also uh, 
provide a very good de detection range with um, five orders of magnitude difference from the lowly expressed genes to the highly expressed genes. So it, it really gives you a good dynamic range of gene detection. And so you have better power to detect differentially expressed genes between conditions. 